Hello and welcome to Compounding Curiosity. I'm your host Kalani Scarrett and this podcast is all about compounding your curiosity alongside my own through thoughtful interviews with interesting guests. For transcripts and detailed show notes, check out the links in the description. Hopefully you're as keen as me to learn something new, so let's get stuck in. My guest today is Andy Ho. Andy is the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director of the London Stock Exchange listed Vena Capital Vietnam Opportunity Fund, which has a net asset value of over 1.2 billion US dollars. At Vena Capital, Andy oversees the capital markets, private equity, fixed income, and venture capital investment teams. He is also the author of Crossing the Street, an actionable guide to investing in Vietnam. In this conversation, we cover entrepreneurship in Vietnam, building a brand and business there, and the process for writing his book. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andy Ho. So Andy, thank you so much for being here. But I think for guests who may not know you, could you just explain a little bit about your background and life up until today? Thanks for having me on, Kalani. Well, my name is Andy Ho. I am the Chief Investment Officer today at uh, Vina Capital. I've been with Mina Capital since uh, 2007. Prior to that, I spent time at Prudential's investment arm. Uh, I think they call it eSpring now. I joined uh, Prudential at, in 2004. Uh, prior to that, I was at uh, Dell Computers in Austin, Texas. I was part of the, uh, the venture investment arm uh, from 2000 to about 2004. And then prior to that, I was fortunate to earn my uh, uh, MBA at the MIT. Before I went to MIT, I spent time at Ernst Young uh, as an auditor. So as you can see, I've uh, had a very fortunate uh, career so far in the auditing world, in the investment world, the venture world, in the US as well as in Vietnam. So when you left Dell Ventures in 2004 to go work in Vietnam, what was your thought process like returning? Did you think it was going to be a permanent shift back? And probably what appealed to you most about returning back to Vietnam? Yeah, I think that's a good question. At that time, uh, my wife and I actually came to Vietnam in late 2003 for vacation. It didn't dawn on us uh, that there was a, a need for someone with my background in terms of investing background because there was a, quite a few life insurance companies um, doing investments in Vietnam. And so there was a search on uh, going on to look for someone who has a Vietnamese background as well as an investment background. So it took us a bit of a, uh, time to think about it. And then ultimately we decided... and. Yeah, the decision was really uh, for a short-term decision, maybe three to five years, and then return back to the United States. I think it has a lot to do with developing uh, one's personal career. If you move too far away from the corporate world in the United States, tendency to think that you'd be disconnected and it'd be hard to reintegrate back to the investment world back in the United States. So at the beginning, it was a short-term thought. But as time went by and as time uh, we spent more time in Vietnam, it became clear to us that our background, our roots, and uh, made a lot of sense for us to be in Vietnam. My wife came back on the financial side of uh, Prudential. She moved all the way up to the executive ranks in Prudential and then left. She's now the CEO of the Generali uh, Life Insurance. So she's done well for herself as well. So we both basically put down roots over the last uh, 10, 15 years in Vietnam uh, on the back of the fact that we are Vietnamese and using our background and education, etc. So uh, at the beginning, it was short term oriented, but uh, in, in hindsight, we, we have taken the decision to stay and, and be part of Vietnam's development for the long term. Yeah, it certainly looks like it's paid off for you. But you mentioned working at Dell Ventures helped shape your thinking around entrepreneurship, investing and building small businesses. But was there anything you learned that once you applied it in Vietnam, that it had to be either scrapped or significantly changed? Like, was there any culture shock in how you approach investments in Vietnam, particularly in the PE space compared to how you approach them at Dell Ventures? I think it's easier to to make the connection between doing venture investment in the US and doing private equity investment in in, uh, Vietnam or frontier market. The similarities are quite uh, more so than the differences. What I mean is that the level of management, the level of sophistication around corporate governance tends to be lower as it relates to startups in the U.S. and also tends to be lower uh, for private businesses in Vietnam because they're effectively family-run businesses, if you will. And so that level of thinking is quite similar. And that sort of helped me connect the bridge, right? So, okay, I've seen this before in startups in the U.S. I've seen it where folks in their 20s and 30s are trying to start out a business with a novel idea, trying to turn that novel idea into a commercial idea. So their sense of corporate governance and business development and strategy tend to be on the weakest side, whereas they have a passion for a particular product and service that they want to develop. 
And it's quite similar in Vietnam in terms of these private businesses or family-run businesses that we participate in. They too have a passion for a particular product or service, but yet they've grown the business in a more or less a family style. So that, that, that I can relate to that. But the things that uh, were different, and there are many, many things that were different. Yes, the cultural, the language, the respect. Uh, again, the folks that we work with in Vietnam are, tend to be much, much older. The folks that we work with in the U.S. tend to be much younger. And the older folks, as you can imagine, are set in their ways in many things, the way they think, the way they, they act, et cetera. So we have to be sensitive to that and also convey to them that over time, if you do this, this, and this, the value of your business grows significantly. And that's the key that, that I have to sort of learn you know, when we get back to Vietnam. It's okay. These are folks that have grown businesses from zero. The differences that I had to go through in terms of understanding how to deal with entrepreneurship in Vietnam is, uh, is slightly different from a cultural perspective. The folks that take the business from zero to $10 million tend to be uh, older and they tend to be set in their ways. But we need to convince them that there are certain things that they ought to do, the right thing in terms of corporate development, setting up a management team uh, that they can sort of walk away and allow the management team to run the business on a day-to-day basis and set up a succession plan and build brands and you know, do the things that you need to do to prepare the company to go public. So these are the things uh, that we have to learn how to, uh, how to work with some of the entrepreneurs in Vietnam over time. You touched on some of the societal and cultural aspects when working in Vietnam. So with regards to foreigners looking to invest there, what are some key things that someone should know before investing in Vietnam? <laughs> to be honest, there's so many things you have to be aware of. Um, you, you touch upon the cultural barriers. Yes, you have to understand that and language. And so, so if you have to break it down to various buckets, if you will. One is you have to understand the macroeconomic situation of Vietnam. It's probably different from where you came from. Uh, two, you have to understand the political system in Vietnam as well. What, what can be done, what cannot be done. Three, you have to understand the legal infrastructure as well. Um, all folks that come to Vietnam to do business, they tend to have a crash course on the legal infrastructure, what you, know, what you can and cannot do. And then you have to look at the human side, human resources, understanding you know, how are people motivated to do the things they do uh, in a country like Vietnam. So those are the basic things that they ought to think about before they come. You know, it depends on how they approach Vietnam. Are they coming in as a multinational? Foreigners coming in, with their multinationals like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, or Prudential, they tend to have a foundation. The foundation is already set for them to come and work in Vietnam. So it's much, much easier. Um, those that come to Vietnam for investments like us uh, tends to be more difficult. They have to sort of find their way around understanding how entrepreneurs develop and what motivates these folks to do the right thing or do the wrong thing for that matter. So that, that, that's one area. Uh, another area is uh, there's a lot of folks that come to Vietnam to open up new businesses. There could be someone sent by head office to open up a branch in Vietnam, a legal branch or a multinational sending up uh, office. Again, they have to go through their basic um, understanding of society and uh, what have you. But I think it really depends on one, what the, what the purpose of, what, what is the purpose of your investment in Vietnam and your participation in this, in this economy and what sort of foundations um, someone have set in advance uh, of your arrival. Uh, those are the various things that come into play as to what they ought to learn in advance of coming to Vietnam. So there are many things to think about when they come to Vietnam. For someone who's new to Vietnam, they might see the frequent comparison with China being the overall growth, the rise in manufacturing and exports. But what do you think are some key differences, either for better or worse, between Vietnam and China? that people are, I guess, misguided in their comparisons? Yeah, I, I think people tend to think that Vietnam is developing uh, in a, a similar pace as China. Uh, I think to, to a certain extent that is correct, um, but China's probably developed at, uh, you know, probably 10 to 20 years ahead of, of Vietnam. You, you can see that in terms of GDP growth. Um, you know, China's GDP growth was in a single, uh, in, in the lower teens, uh, not too long ago. Now they're in the single digits. Vietnam had a chance to go into the uh, uh, you know single teens. We went um, to about 10, 11 percent at one time, but now we're back to the single digits. So the development, the pace of development, is somewhat behind uh, China. But we're there. We're, we're, we understand. We can see how that's developed. But I think the key difference is that the scale of the economy is significantly different. They have 1.4 billion plus people. We have less than 100 million people. So the size, the scale is significantly different. 
but the way the economy, the practice of the government as it treats foreign investment as well as uh, domestic investment is quite similar in that they do encourage reinvestment of capital. They encourage foreign capital to come and they, they encourage domestic folks to reinvest the profit that they make into uh, manufacturing. And the manufacturing is predominantly to export, to generate hard currency, but as well as, well as to service the domestic economy. And so, and, and I think this is quite similar to other um, East Asian economies like uh, Malaysia, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan. Government, uh, they, they encourage folks to uh, reinvest the profit in machinery, equipment, manufacturing uh, for developing products for export. And then you can generate the foreign currency and you take that, you reinvest further. And so that's been the model over the last 10, 20, 30 years in East Asia. And that seems to be quite successful. And I think Vietnam is going down the same uh, model. The only difference is that our scale is a bit different. But we are seeing the fruits of that happening now. And you can see by the fact that the U.S.-China trade war has allowed Vietnam to step up to export significantly to the U.S. Um, for the so much, in fact, that the U.S. have claimed that Vietnam is a currency manipulator because of surplus. But that's sort of gone away with the new administration. But it comes to show that um, we do reinvest the capital. The country does reinvest the profit. And they're prepared to produce the good exports not only to the United States, but to Europe, and they can do it on a large scale. Uh, but as far as the economy is concerned, uh, how we compare it in China, I think the biggest difference is the scale. Uh, we're nowhere near the scale of, of China, and we need to keep that in mind and be humble about that. You touched on manufacturing there, and with around two-thirds of foreign direct investment going into manufacturing in Vietnam, what do you think are some undervalued or maybe unappreciated sectors outside of manufacturing in Vietnam? It depends on what the angle you're coming in from. If you're coming in from a manufacturing multinational angle, um, there's not a whole lot you can do because I, I sense that a lot of multinationals want to take advantage of the low labor costs to do manufacturing in Vietnam for export. But if you come in from another angle, like for us, for example, us, we, we come in from a, an investment angle. We, we actually focus on domestic investment, domestic companies to invest in. So we'll look at other things like, for example, services, hospital, healthcare services, banking, but I have to admit that the businesses that we invest in tend to provide the goods and services to the domestic economy rather than to export. And so the value that we provide or the, the investments that we provide to businesses in Vietnam tends to be that for Vietnamese businesses to develop and provide services for the domestic economy, for the domestic growth. I think in the long term, there are a number of areas that is quite interesting, not only from a domestic investor, but also from a foreign investor's perspective. Is one is mining. There's a lot of uh, products that have not been mined in Vietnam, and the government keeps a very close uh, eye on that. Um, you know, compared to Indonesia, there's a lot of mining in uh, different types of products like coal or gas. Vietnam has hasn't really tapped into that area uh, much uh, as of yet. And the second area is um, the there's a lot of uh, well trained technical folks in Vietnam. They're well trained in terms of engineer, so the ability to develop high tech in terms of um, uh, internet, online, or even uh, healthcare, uh, high tech uh, can be sourced quite significantly in Vietnam if you want, you're willing to take on working with the technical uh, trainings that the engineers in Vietnam have developed over the last uh, five to ten years. There's a there's a huge group of uh, well trained engineers that can uh, help uh, businesses develop products and services, uh, not only in the online business, the digital business, but also in the healthcare business. And so that's an area where I think hasn't been really tapped. If an entrepreneur from Hong Kong or Singapore or uh, Silicon Valley wants to invest, then this is an, a great area to take advantage of. So one thing I've heard you talk about is the high rates of female leadership within Vietnam when compared to other countries. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper on that and understand a little better, maybe some of the factors that help drive that. Yeah. And it's just a theory that I have over the years as we invest in businesses. We it's sort of work back, right? We, we, we look at the business that we invest in and we feel that those that are led by women tend to do better than men. And then we sort of start diving further. Does the participation in female in the workforce, is that number higher than men or not? And it turns out that in some sense it is because if, you can imagine if you have a, a balance um, base of female and male worker in the workforce and the managerial level, as time goes by, the ability for the female to step up to be the leader is the probability is is the same, right? Because the population is the same that comes in. And so what we also found is that the the one of the key um, 
difference is that in the culture of Vietnam, education is highly valued. And as a result, the family do push for the, the, the children to be well-educated. Um, and they don't discriminate between the boy and the girl. They push both. So if you look at the um, number of people that graduate from, at the college level, and you look at the female and male population graduating, it's quite similar. It's about 50-50. So you can see that the, the amount of education, both for men and women, are quite fair and balanced as they leave the university system. And as time goes by, you can also see that a lot of women are able to do well because they're quite diligent and focused in the financial space. And they're able to use the financial space and even the marketing space to make their way up to the leadership echelon. And that's why we're able to see, hey, we have a group of people that come into the workforce that's fairly balanced between men and women. So the probability of a, of a woman leading a business is just as good as a man leading a business. And then we go back to the reason, okay, well, then all things being equal, why is a business being led by a woman like a pharmaceutical company and being led by a man? Why is the one led by a woman more successful? And then we start asking these questions. It turns out that the women, um, they tend to be more focused on the business. The men, they do well. Uh, don't get me wrong. They do well. But once they've done well, their mindset uh, becomes less focused. They may play golf. They often go to me and say, okay, uh, here's my handicap, Andy, and say, well, you must be spending a lot of time at the golf course. No woman has ever come to me and said, here's my handicap, Andy. None, right? And so it begs the question as well, you know, every time you play a round of golf, that's five hours out of the day. If you play three rounds, that's 15 hours out of the day. And where do you find the time? From there, you can sort of think through that the level of focus uh, tends to be less with men than women. And then women, again, if you ask more and more questions, you find that they're quite diligent, and they're very detail-oriented, and they do listen quite, quite a bit to their uh, executive team and management team to get the information, but they are very, very diligent. And I think because, one, they're focused, and two, they have the time to be diligent and to make that decision. Key things is that ability to focus as on how the women leadership can be, uh, all things being equal, as successful men leading corporate businesses uh, in Vietnam. The other thing is, as we also wind the, the, the time frame back, we can see that the older generation of women, maybe in their 60s, 70s today, they'll probably retire now. Um, you can see that um, they're part of the, the generation that went through the Vietnam War. Um, and going through the war, you can imagine that their, their husband or their spouse may have participated in the war and, and unfortunately you know, didn't make it out of the war. And the woman is responsible for looking after the family. And the woman's looking after their money and they're looking after growing the business. They have a higher level of motivation. They've been through hard time. And as a result, they're able to grow a, a you know, business. It, that is, to me is sort of a population game because the number of men and women, the men, when women are probably more in terms of trying to be an entrepreneur than men. And as a result, they've grown up. And as a result, they've turned around and they've taught their daughters and their, you know, their sons that you know, women leadership is just as important as men leadership. So probably just curious for my end, is high levels of female leadership something that's spoken about in Vietnam or is it more just a given, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. No, it's not spoken here. It's just a, it's just a, a given. It's, it's very natural here. Nobody, nobody bothers to go and do a diversity uh, review of a business and say, oh, we don't have enough women. Nobody really does that. But, so it's, a really, it's, a, it's just a natural phenomenon. So to continue on the topic of executives and executive alignment, You've mentioned previously about the ways you can achieve executive alignment, but one thing I'd love to understand a little bit better is the idea of forced vacations and maybe how that plays a role. I'm not sure about forced vacation as it relates to executive. This came about because I, I sort of understood how commercial banks operate globally. Commercial banks actually ask some of their managers to take forced vacation, and it has a lot to do with making sure that um, there aren't anything funny going on. Because when you take that forced vacation of two to four weeks, someone else steps into your role for that temporary period of time. And if something funny happen, is happening, then that new person who steps in sort of say, well, hang on, this is not normal. And then the flag goes up. So we've sort of learned from that. And that's just one of many, many tools that we may ask the corporation to use, not at the executive level, but at the managerial level to ensure that Everyone is, everyone's interest is aligned with the corporation and there's no leakages from the business. That's just one of many tools that we would use. But I, I wouldn't say I would use that as for the executive level. I would say that more dominant at the managerial level 
to make sure that, hey, if you take a four-week vacation, someone's stepping into your, your, your shoes, especially in procurement. The procurement's the easiest area for leakages. And if, you're, if someone's replacing you for four weeks in procurement and you're seeing things that are not right, the flag goes up and then you can sort of investigate. But I think more importantly, if, if people know in advance that they're going to be asked to take vacation for four weeks every year and someone else is going to step in, they're less likely to do these things. It's like a preventive measure. So in your book, you talk about how strategic buyers in Vietnam often look for three key elements being brand equity, distribution channels, and scalability. I'd love to talk more specifically about what you look for on the intangible side of a business. So obviously brand is incredibly important, but there's a lot that goes into a brand. So I'd love to hear specifics of what you think the best company builders are good at in terms of building a brand in Vietnam. Yeah, I, it's hard to say. Um, I, I can only look so backwards and say, look, if a multinational is like CJ or a Diageo, when they come to Vietnam, uh, what do they value most? They, they value brand. We're going to buy, we're going to pay a lot of money for the brand. What does brand equity mean? It means that most people in Vietnam recognize this brand and they value it. You know, to the manufacturing, the ability to manufacture these goods for domestic consumption as well as for export is, is, is also very important. You have to have a good distribution channel, right? Because a lot of times multinationals will take advantage of that distribution channel to put their own products through. And so, so that's why we feel that most likely when a multinational come to Vietnam, they'll, they'll value at least two or maybe even three of these elements when they, when they look at a business. So, but then if you look at the entrepreneur and you ask the question, can they build the brand? Can they build the distribution channel? Or can they build the, the uh, manufacturing? It's difficult. Each company is different. Each company is different. Each entrepreneur is different. And even in today's uh, millennial, uh, the younger generation, uh, my sense is they're good at building brand. And so you can go to them and they can build great brand. But their ability to do manufacturing scalability is, is a bit more questionable. They're going to have to rely on the, the 30 to 40 to 50 year old uh, person who's been through operations, right? And distribution as well, because developing operations and distribution does take a lot of experience as well as connection. Now, how do we do this? How do we do it right? What are the mistakes that we've made? So in terms of looking at each of these value propositions, uh, who's good at doing what? It really depends on the situation. And I would say in today's age, um, brand building is completely different from 20 years ago. And it does take a mindset uh, in today who understands social media, who understands digital branding, who understands the, 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 the traditional channel of television commercial as well who also understands promotion, who also has to understand KOL, how to use KOL properly. There's so many things that go on today that never existed 20 years ago in terms of brand building that you do need a new, basic, a new generation look at this. To move on to the process of writing your book, what did your actual writing process look like, especially on top of having such a demanding job and with a family at home? How do you manage to get it done? To be honest, I was very fortunate. We, we I have a gentleman, his, his name is on the face of the book as well, his name is Joe Wyden. He is our head of corporate communication at the firm. And actually, um, we were approached by the publisher many, many years ago because there was a need for investors outside Vietnam to understand Vietnam better. And they've asked me to write this book um, a while back. And obviously, with the, um, my job and family, like you said, it was difficult. And so Joe and I actually went and <laughs> we actually recruited a couple of um, uh, people to write. Uh, at the beginning, we recruited a, a lady who was a former writer for the Financial Times. Uh, it didn't work out. Uh, and then we recruited a, a very uh, distinguished professor at uh, a university. That didn't work out as well. Then I told Joe, why don't you write it? You understand the business. You know where the data is. And so I said, okay. So he took on this, 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 this um, project. And I think it took him a little less than a year to write this. And I would spend time with him once, twice, three times a week for a few hours. And then he also uh, got a chance to speak with some of the other CEOs, the business that we invest in, as well as the investment professionals around the office. And he, he sort of knew the people, uh, the stakeholders. I think in hindsight, it became easier working with Joe or someone within the firm because they knew where to go for information. Whereas working with someone outside from the FT or university, they're struggling to figure, okay, where do we get this information? And then the other thing is um, you know, making sure the information is consistent or reasonable as well. So you got to go back and check, right? This is what this person said. We invested 25 million. We made this much money. Well, hang on. What was the valuation of this business back then? You can invest and you get this IRR, but if the valuation is completely inconsistent, you're going to be in trouble. So that was sort of the process. And I, I think it, it worked out quite well. And the publisher is also thinking, 
what can we talk about next in, in the realms of Vietnam and how do we uh, tell the world about the investment in Vietnam? So that's what we're thinking. Yeah, no, it's certainly interesting. And not just saying this, but I honestly love the book and the examples you gave, especially because in investing, I love to invert and study what not to do. And I think you illustrated that well. But you touched on a couple of points there. But what were the, some of the hardest parts of getting the book done that you didn't expect? Was it just getting the writing done itself? or? Yeah, the, getting the writing was very challenging at the beginning when it changes. I think one of the key areas is that your memories sort of go away <laughs> after a while, right? And uh, when you go back and say, okay, we need a concrete example, and in your mind, some, it, for some reason, you thought the issue was A, but when you started digging back, it's actually B. And then you say, well, if it wasn't A and it's B now, is it relevant to the point that I was trying to make? And so then we go, okay, maybe it's not relevant anymore. So let's rethink about what's the other example. So I think over time, I'm getting old, I guess, my, your mind plays trick on you. And I find that your mind tends to develop memories along the lines that you wish it is rather than what it actually was. And so it's important, even if it's your a work on your investment, it's important to go back and see exactly what happened because most of the time, it isn't really what your mind has created the world to be. So that was a challenge because it took a lot of time. And that was the great thing about Joe. I said, okay, I would say something and obviously, that was what I thought it was. And then he would do research and say, well, I mean, it wasn't that way. It was this way. Oh, okay, let's rethink. And so that obviously took a lot of time. If the issue was not consistent with the point I was trying to make, then we had to find another example. And so that was a bit of a challenge. Um, the, the other challenge we had was also, as you, can, as you read through the book, you can probably tell that we had to fictionalize the character, right? The manuscript, the original manuscript has all the names. And so you can imagine that isn't going to be released, right? So we have to fictionalize because the characters do exist in the business community today, as well as uh, government people as well. So if they saw their name in the book and the way it's been written, I, I don't think I'd be welcome anywhere around the city. So, um, so you can also imagine that, yes, these are examples, but they're, they've been edited uh, so that uh, people can appreciate the story, but yet we aren't getting any people in trouble. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's probably the best way to go about it. As a reader, I certainly appreciated the story, but I always did wonder about that. But the thing is, if you, if you, if you talk to a couple of smart people in the community, they can probably connect the dots. Yeah, that's true. But to move on more generally, it's probably clear that there's both merits and limitations to both Western and Eastern cultures. But from your own experiences, having lived and worked in the US and Vietnam, what parts of each culture have you embodied? And what advice would you give to those with a similar background to yourself? If someone was trying to develop their career, and really depends on what where they're coming from. If they came from the United States um, and they wanted to develop their career in Vietnam, I would only think to ask them, well, do you have any sort of roots in Vietnam? Why do you want to develop a career in Vietnam? Uh, if you're an American person, uh, let's say hypothetically, you're a Polish person living in New York, there isn't really a connection here. Why do you want to go back to Vietnam? But if you are you're a Vietnamese descendant and you grew up in the United States, you want to come back to Vietnam, my advice for them would be, look, do the hard work in the U.S. And learn the basic stuff. And that really means spending at least 10 years at a corporation or two or three corporations in the United States and develop uh, a few things. One, develop the discipline. There is a way of doing business in the U.S. that there's a discipline, there's a level of respect, there's a community, there, there's a teamwork uh, that you have to develop. With that experience, when you come back to Vietnam, the value is quite significant. But if you're sitting in Vietnam and you want to, you know, develop like, your career in Vietnam, it's a completely different angle, right? Um, then you know, obviously, so if you want to go into the investment world, a lot of people want to, you know, they, they like to go into investment world. They think they're sex, it's a sexy business. First thing I tell them, it's not a sexy business. It's about learning. You really need to appreciate and like to learn. Investment's all about learning. If you don't like learning, you don't want to spend time reading the books, reading the financial statements asking things and you see something that's inconsistent in the financial statement and go look for it, go Google it, research it. If you're not into that, then investment becomes difficult because you're not able to connect all the dots to understand what's happening in the business. So I would encourage them to learn and to be able to, to want to learn, to be motivated to learn. But, but as a career, I tell them, go to the big four. I, the big four is a great place to lay your foundation. Uh, I went through Ernst & Young in my early years. It allowed me, it taught me how to read financial statements. It also allowed me to be able to work with leaders in the business, the, the, the chief accountant, the CFO, 
not the corporation, and be able to develop a relationship with these folks and develop, develop a language to talk to these folks as well. You're going to need that in the investment world. And the, and the other thing that came out of the big four back then when I joined was the big eight. You learned a level of ethics and morality that the big four teaches you that what's, what's right and what's wrong, you know, um, and that's very important in the investment world because ultimately you are not, you're probably not investing your money. You're investing someone else and they're going to have to trust you to invest that. And you have to develop a uh, working ethics uh, at a place like the big four that allows you to develop it. And investors say, well, if you don't have investment experience, but you do have big four experience, okay, I can appreciate that uh, because there's a level of ethics that you've learned through these organizations. Overall in Vietnam, as an investor, uh, there are any overall themes or trends that we haven't covered so far? Like, what are you most excited about as an investor in Vietnam? We we can we can sit all day talk and talk about that. I'm I'm excited about many things about Vietnam in terms of investment. But I think by and large, we do like to focus on sectors and companies in those sectors that contribute to the growth are part of the growth of the domestic economy. Right? You have a population that's almost 100 million people. And the GDP per capita is about two and a half to three and a half thousand. So it's on the lower side. And so you can see that if, if all goes well, these people are going to get wealthier and wealthier to the, on the average, about five to 10% wealthier each year. Because as GDP grows, they, they get wealthier. And they're going to spend money. They're going to spend money on uh, transportation, on healthcare, on financial products, on food and beverage, on clothing, and all this stuff when they spend money. This is, these are, Great areas for people to invest in. You look at, you know, you're probably European, um, and you look at the European economy. The GDP per capita is quite high already, and the ability to grow further and further is quite limited. And as a result, whatever you sell, um, you can still sell it, but the potential is much less simply because the growth of their wealth isn't growing as fast as folks uh, in Vietnam. So we play on the fact that produce a product that. Uh, more and more people, as they come into this wealth class, maybe call it the middle class, if you will, as they go into the middle class, they're going to buy more and more. We want to invest in hospitals that as they reach this middle class, they're going to use more and more. That's what excites me. And that group is getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, every day. And that's what these businesses have, have become so successful in. But we can certainly dive down each of the sectors, where the exciting parts, where the risks as well, and, and where, where can things go wrong. So when comparing Vietnam against itself, do you think Vietnam is living up to its potential? Yeah, I think it, you know different people have different answers. I like to say, I like to see that Vietnam is developing at a pace. It, it is a good pace. We actually tried to do, to go at a, a faster pace in, in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, but if you go too fast, what the economists will tell you is you create a situation of uh, instability and instability is measured in terms of inflation. Instability is measured in terms of devaluation of the currency. Um, it's like driving a car, right? If your car is meant to be driven at uh, 100 kilometers to 120 kilometers, but you actually drive it 200 kilometers, you can probably do it. But I, I assure you, you can't run it 200 kilometers for six hours straight and don't expect something to go wrong. So I think the economy in Vietnam, just like many other developing economies around the world, there's a pace that if they get into that pace, it's the sweet spot. They'll develop at that pace. Much more than that, it's going to cause some side effect. And I think Vietnam is at that pace uh, at the moment. And in, if, when people recognize that at that pace and they can look at the companies that benefit at that pace, when I say companies that benefit at the rate of a GDP growth of 6 7% per annum, usually we see a, a, the pace of growth in the business to be about three times. So hypothetically, if the economy is growing at 5% per annum in terms of GDP over the next three to five years, we would expect a company to grow about 15%, okay? And here's why. One is you have to grow at GDP level. That's basic. Two, you would grow, GDP is measured in terms of real. So it doesn't have inflation in there. So you got to build some inflation in. So let's assume inflation of another 5%. So you need a 10%. And when we make the investment, we like to think that we're investing in the, the best company in that sector. So being best, that means you have to grow above the average rate. So add another 5%. So the rule of thumb is, if the economy is growing at X, we like to see the, the business we invested grow at 3X. And that's sort of the, the, the typical ideal rate of these businesses. But if they came back and said, I'm growing at you know, 7X, then I said, whoa, do you have the foundation to grow at 7X? Are you going to borrow too much money? What are you going to get the people to, to, to produce? Are you going to 
you're going to be paying too much money for the people. Corporate governance, or do you have proper corporate governance in place? Are people going to leak money left and right because you don't have proper corporate governance? There are many, many questions that come into play when someone comes to you and say, well, I'm, do, I'm growing at seven, eight, nine times GDP level, right? If someone came to me and said, oh, no, I, I want to grow safely at three to four times GDP, I'd say, yeah, that makes sense. To move into my closing round of questions, what is the most undervalued experience university age students don't give weight to? Like what's an underrated skill or an experience that you think they should have? They should have coding, programming. My son's going through school now. He's at Purdue University. And I can't impress upon him how much engineering discipline and coding is so important. Uh, Once you have the discipline and you leave, the math, the discipline and the coding you can find yourself in many, many types of situations and you'd be quite valuable, right? I think um, a lot of the students, when I went to college, I was fortunate because I went through and I studied computer engineering. Um, but a lot of folks, um, they didn't think about it that way and they, and they find it difficult to, get, to find jobs uh, later on in, in, in life. And a lot of them have to go back to school and actually take on coding, right? And so I think, that's a, I think it's a key skill set and it doesn't take a whole lot it's just like a language right just learning a language even simpler in language it's done in alphanumeric and it's done in english right so if you're an english speaker it should be easy for sure and it's only getting more important by the day um for you personally are there any books that have been very influential in shaping your worldview i wouldn't say there's a, a, a one book or two books. i think i i've appreciated reading a lot of autobiography um and seeing how people develop over time and steve jobs got a great book in his autobiography. Um, you have other uh, leaders. When you read them, you sort of uh, understand how they approach some of the challenges that they have in their lifetime. Uh, but I have to admit, the autobiography that they themselves write is not as valuable as the autobiography that someone else wrote, right? <laughs> and so there's a different, like uh, Mao. Mao has a book out. And if you read it from uh, someone else's perspective, you can see it, there's a different angle to the whole thing. Um, so if I were to, I mean, I thought people look, if you're going to read books, try to read main, as many autobiography as possible and, and try to get the ones that are written by third party. And, and so, so they, they, these, these leaders, they are leaders by default. They've done very well, right? They've done something right. Now, the key is trying to understand how they, how they manage some of the challenges that they face through their lives and what are those challenges. And because those are most likely, uh, unless you're going to be a general, if you're in the business world, you are going to face some of these challenges. Yeah, and I guess that goes well with what you said previously about how you imagine something happened isn't quite exactly how it probably turned out. So when someone else looks into it, it ends up being a totally different story. Yes, that's exactly it. So when you write your own biography, everything is rosy. And someone else wrote it, then, oh, it wasn't that, it wasn't that rosy. <laughs> so my final question is, what plans or vision do you see for yourself in the next five to 10 years? What areas are you most curious about going forward? Yeah, so again, I, I love to learn. I spent um, a few years ago, I actually sat down with my son to learn about cryptocurrency, look at blockchain, the technology, what makes it important. And uh, aside from using you know, it to make Bitcoin, what, where is the application? And this is an example of curiosity trying to learn. Going forward, um, right now I'm spending a bit of time looking at quantum computing. What is the application of quantum computing? Is it even feasible, right? Um, and there's a there's a you know there's another branch that goes out is uh, molecular computing. Uh, it's m- m- maybe a little bit easier than quantum. But my point is, I every year or two I, I kind of pick up things I want to learn and go deep dive into it. But I think ultimately I want to be able to wrap up the things that I've learned uh, over time and go and teach at a university. So I like to see myself. I don't see myself in this world maybe more than five ten years after you know, any more than more than five ten years. Uh, I think my the value add for me would be to take what I've learned and, and go teach at a university, whether it's a local university in Vietnam or somewhere in Europe or the United States, perfectly fine. Being able to see the next generation of folks to come up to replace me, to sit in my seat. It's, that's, that's the beauty of this whole thing. Right? Somebody has to sit here. I'm not going to sit here forever. And when they sit here, I want them to grow the AUM you know, three or four times what we have today. I absolutely love that answer and the curiosity and optimism is just infectious. So, Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Sure, sure. I hope that helps. And if you have any other questions, do let me know. So, there we go, I guess. Andy, really appreciate it again. I think people are going to take away a lot from this. So, uh, cheers. Thanks for being on. (laughs) Okay. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out the website, compoundingpodcast.com. 
On the website, you'll find every episode complete with transcripts, show notes, and other related resources. Either way, links to all content mentioned will be in the description below. Also be sure to sign up for my weekly newsletter, Curated by Kalani, where I share what I've been reading, learning, and watching for that week. Same as the podcast, it's compressed to impress, and I aim for maximum return on your time invested. Sign up at kalanis.substack.com. So that's K-A-L-A-N-I-S.substack.com. You can also connect with me on Twitter, at Skarat Kalani. But until next time, have a good one.